Hello, Canfiles viewers. This is Aiden Jonah, editor in chief of the Canfiles, here co hosting the sixth episode of Canada and Palestine The War on Zionism with Laith Maruf of Free Palestine TV. Laith, thanks for joining me again. It's always good to be with you, Aiden. Thank you. So, Laith, let's hop into it as per usual. What's been the situation uh, around the axis of resistance uh, in these uh, recent times? Well, uh, obviously, the biggest story is the American code Israeli peace ceasefire proposal that the U.S. says Israel wrote and the Israelis say it's the Americans that wrote it. <laughs> Sorry, and we've been stuck in this uh, kind of uh, no man's no man's proposal <laughs> for for over a week and it's clear that it's just a waste of time uh we heard yesterday uh bin Giver and smoltrich saying that they will withdraw from the uh, government coalition and collapse the government of israel if netanyahu agrees to this ceasefire so it's not going to happen uh on the ground we continue to see the Israelis uh, lose a lot of uh, men uh, on in the battles of Gaza. Uh, we have just uh, heard from uh, the uh, former Minister of Defense, Eisenkot, who's, who's also responsible for the Bahia Doctrine, the doctrine of mass destruction of civilian uh, infrastructure in order to force the enemy to um, to you know accept defeat uh, as we see it playing out in Gaza this mass bombardment of the civilian infrastructure uh, this so Eisenkot said that the Israelis fought with a full division uh, in the battle of Jabalia a full division means uh, depending on an army uh, 10 to 30,000 soldiers uh, and with their air support they fought against one brigade of uh fighters in jabaria brigade is around a thousand fighters so it was thirty thousand to a thousand and they fought for 21 days and they lost so now we know that militarily on the ground in gaza the israeli military is totally defeated uh, we saw also a video come out from Hamas multiple videos but one of them this week that is uh an ambush in a tunnel where the uh, Hamas fighters kind of uh, you know taunted the Israelis to follow them into this tunnel the video shows us a drone being sent into the down the shaft uh and going out and then the Hamas fighters booby trapping the whole uh, tunnel and then this uh, special force comes in and they get slaughtered. Uh, Hamas has announced this, uh, you know, during the Battle of Jabalia that this happened. The Israelis denied that they lost any soldiers there, dead or captured. So in this video, Hamas showed us the bodies of the soldiers. And they also showed us one face of one of the soldiers. And they asked is the Israeli in this video they ask this question in writing in Hebrew and in English is the Israeli government lying that they didn't lose any uh soldiers inside this tunnel or are these mercenaries and so uh, now we have this big question of are there mercenary special forces on the ground that are not Israeli citizens and, you know, clearly we have tens of thousands of Canadians, Americans, and Brits uh, that flew into uh, Palestine for this battle and that don't have Israeli citizenship. We also have all the mercenaries that were withdrawn from Ukraine to continue this battle. And there's all the special forces of the Americans, British, French, Germans, Canadians that are really on the ground. Uh, and we don't know what's happening there. So those this is in terms of the battle inside Gaza. On the front here uh, with Lebanon, things are at the highest intensity ever 
uh, and uh, Hezbollah is, uh, has, uh, you know, been using multi-layered complex attacks, uh, and they are uh, the biggest waves of missiles uh, since actually 2006. Uh, the, um, you know, again yesterday the. Israeli cabinet was meeting to make a decision about supposedly invading Lebanon. We've been hearing these threats for seven months now, or eight months almost now. But yesterday, the uh, cabinet of the Israeli government was meeting to make a decision. And uh, less than half an hour of before the cabinet meeting, Hezbollah released three videos in a row of of operations that have been taken uh, over the last few months, but they've never shown us these videos before. And it was clear that these videos were being released half an hour before the decision of the cabinet or the meeting of the cabinet, the Israeli cabinet, in order to uh, send messages to this meeting for it to be discussed. One of these videos was of, uh, of an attack on the Golan Heights, uh, the Syrian occupied Golan Heights, uh, the major, uh, one of the major bases there. And it, they showed you how a wave of Katyoshas were thrown in, in the direction of this base in order to have the air defenses, the Iron Dome activated so they can spot where it is. So you see the, the uh, missiles from the Iron Dome uh, firing to, to, uh, to intercept the Katyusha missiles. And that makes it visible, obviously, where it is. And suddenly you see the suicide drone hitting the uh, the air Iron Dome. And then another video was of these uh, Almaz uh, ATGMs. Um, and these are advanced third generation uh, being fired uh, in a, you know, usually ATGMs have to go in a straight line, but this is, this is ones that can go up in a in a loop, and then you know it has a camera, and you can see where it's going, and you can see this missile going to the barracks of these soldiers in this base, and the soldiers running out as it's coming closer, and this missile hitting one of them directly at the doors of this these barracks. So uh, clearly, the Hezbollah wanted on purpose to release these videos for the Israeli cabinet to understand some of the weapons that have been used but have not been announced yet, and the strategies uh, that are going to, uh, you know, lead uh, in, in be used in a, a full confrontation. Uh, and all over yesterday, practically all the bases of the Israelis in the Golan Heights were carpet bombed, and we see now fires raging in all of the northern Galilee, uh, northern occupied Palestine for the last two days uh, in response to the Israelis using white phosphorus uh, to burn some of the forests in the south on the border. So this is a, a you know, brief of everything that's happening. And, you know, obviously there's the Yemen. They've hit two different ships in the Mediterranean. They also hit... Uh, the American um, aircraft carrier Eisenhower at least twice, and this is you know the the, the wider picture of the war. All right, thanks, Leif. So, looking on the Canada side, a bit of things. One thing that's well, it'll be released on the capitals by the time this really gets around, anyways, for release. So uh, it'll be soon. Now. This these committee hearings uh, that were held at the parliament, and of course they were at the rather hilariously named Justice and Human Rights Committee. You know, the colonizers really, you really do love their jumbled up names, eh? So you, euphemisms, the, they love euphemisms. Yeah, euphemisms. That's probably the best word for it. Um, these were three hearings in May, and basically there were the ones supposedly against anti-Semitism. Of course, that's that's garbage. We all know that. But what's interesting here, uh, and really the case that Mukiaba makes in the article, is that this is all about trying to shove the NATO ethnic cleansing plan down the throats 
of the rebellious young student protesters. And with the ICC, with the international uh, court moves, you have a set of politicians that are afraid of prosecution. They want to basically violently crack down on us or just completely destroy lives if they can just do that. So I will say before we get on to other parts of this element is they actually said no more, they wanted no more Latham Roof in one of the hearings. Um, so you still rattled them to this very day, Lath. Uh, just an FYI for you there. Um, but I, you know, you wouldn't shock you to know it was Anthony House Father Liberal, Melissa Lansman, uh, conservative that were, you know, very, very heavy in terms of you know, having their part in the charade. They brought some of the university presidents uh, in one of the meetings to basically, you know, pressure them into just doing more against the students, which is a little funny, especially when they bring the University of Toronto McGill ones, because they're those two universities are desperately trying to get police to crack basically skulls of students, right? Um, when you know when they want to clear these encampments, that's the technical meaning. But let's be real here. Violence is going to have to come with that from police. Police don't even want to do that, though. Police don't even want to do that. So, you know, the, you know, if these Zionists are insane enough, they should be give more material for the uh, anti-Zionist, anti-imperialists to show how, how these insane things are. And they should bring the Toronto police and the Montreal police and drag them in front and have them testify about why oppression is happening, why it isn't happening, because you want to bring the U of T and the Yale presidents to demand more, but, you know, these slavish uh, contributors to imperialism are just, they're doing everything they can, right? Um, but it, kind of, it just registers on this desperation. You know, in terms of universities, they're a big target of this. The one proposal was to withhold federal funds for universities that don't adopt the pro-Israel IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, uh, trying to clarify, trying to declare opposition to Israel's existence as legal hate speech. Of course, uh, Sammy Dune, which is much hated, you know, they stand with Palestinian prisoners, their Palestinian liberation, you know, folks organization. Uh, you know, this attempt desires to register it as a terrorist organization. Um, so it's, it's desperate. It's desperation. It's desperation. It really is. Um, there's some weird comments about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which has been severely misused uh, in in Canada. It's even been misused around um, the, the pushing the hello more myth uh, that it was justified under uh, under this. I believe it was either the Ontario or the federal level. I think it actually might have been the Ontario um, level. Uh, so it has been misused, but the way it was referred to was, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't a critical, actual critical analysis of it. It was just the ODI uh, hatred, et cetera, stuff, which is nonsense. Um, it's a poor critique of it. So just in the whole, I don't want to take my entire time up on, on this because there's a whole article for people to read, but these committee hearings were just a complete, you know, the farce. There were farce, there were a Zionist um, movement. You know, of course, you even the even the ones that portray themselves uh, really won't say they're explicitly anti-Zionist, like IJV, etc. Even they didn't get the the invite. This was, you know, hardcore Zionists only. Um, so it, that it is what it is there. Um, but the other interesting stories there I was from the Maple. Actually, they were taking a look at the export of military goods, and Canada exported more than 30 million uh, military goods, uh, wise to Israel 2023, and it's uh, actually an increase of more than sixfold in the last 10 years of these exported military goods to Israel. So Canada keeps vote keeps uh, actively supporting um, the genocide. Uh, that Israel is conducting. You had a rather hilarious um, talk from Canada Land's arch-Zionist Jesse Brown, 
who had an event titled The Slow Pogrom, Anti-Semitism in Canadian Media. And this was Davide Mastracci who went there uh, and covered it. Um, people can go ahead. They'll find the article on the on the Maple's site, but it was just very funny. Um, just, just, just a clown. Something like Jesse. Yeah, Brown. I mean, uh, everything is a pogrom. Everything is a holocaust. Everything is a Kristallnacht. You know, uh, when it comes to to Zionist, and uh, if you don't agree, you know, it's just an indicator that you're anti-Semite. <laughs> this is this is where it's hilarious. You know, I mean, there's a huge purge, a pogrom, really, of journalists that have any human position on Palestine. They don't even have to be anti-Zionist. They don't have to be pro-resistance even. They even just a, a, a modicum of support for human the humanness of Palestinians. You have been purged in all of the media across Canada. This is uh, not a joke. Uh, but this guy, this Jewish white supremacist that runs the Canada land, wants to flip the picture. It's always, they, they live in the upside down world, like almost like stranger things, you know? They live in the upside down world and they wanna convince us all that that's the true reality. Uh, it's laughable and actually uh, it, it shows you how much of a psychosis Zionism is. And the followers of Zionism are so uh, disassociated from reality at this point. And it's good, actually. The more crazy they go, the more unable to come up with any uh, reasonable analysis uh, to put forward to the larger public who are all witnessing reality with us, hearing it and watching it and reading it of the truth of what's happening on the ground, the better, uh, because they will you know, uh, go crazy. I don't know if I cut you off there or if you wanted me to comment more. Oh, um, no, it, it, no, like, it's, uh, it's, it's all good. You're going to work perfectly fine to jump in there. Uh, so that was there. Now there was an uh, article in the breach. They uh, got some documents uh, from Access Information, I believe. Uh, not going to be sure, I'm sure on that. Uh, but it's an interesting one in the fact that just it shows that McGill really wanted deans and instructors to prevent discussion of student policy that was calling on university, McGill University to divest uh, from uh, Israeli apartheid. Just so it again how repressive the atmosphere is at, um, is at McGill. Um, and these are McGill University and U of T. Uh... Obviously, these are the most prestigious universities in the country and have the biggest endowments, kind of, you know, um, um, and alumni donations. And in fact, uh, I was personally told that a Zionist billionaire in Canada offered UFT a endowment of one billion Canadian dollars if they are able to kick out the students and shut down the encampment and if that they do if they didn't that he will cost them one billion dollars in donations so it's a it's a carrot and a stick which means the threat was that basically to cut off all alumni donations and i think the zionists can actually uh deliver on that from the time I was at Concordia University in 2001 and 2002, after we shut down Netanyahu, the Zionists, uh, you know, closed the faucet on all the donations. And uh, friends of ours that worked at the alumni um, office uh, of Concordia University, which receives all the donations, you know, they were saying on average they would receive a few million dollars in donations a month at that time. Uh, and 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 after we shut down Netanyahu, the Zionists managed to bring it to a zero. Zero dollars of donations were coming to Concordia University. And this is why Concordia University at the time went ballistic and uh, went crazy after the students that were involved. Um, and, you know, some of those students were 
expelled and not allowed to return, like uh, Eve Engler, for instance, was one of those people. Um, and so we're, you know, we can see that this is a reality. This is very behind the scenes. The Zionists are offering any, as much money as these universities want for them to shut down these uh, encampments. And they are threatening to shut down all donations to these universities if they are not able to uh, deliver on their uh, the orders of the Zionists. Right. So the other th there's many other things here too, and we'll get to that now. Uh, I think there is an open letter uh, around the CRA, and of course them continuing a lot of these charities to uh, enable uh, Israel's uh, genocide. So that's there. I think there's a parliamentary uh, petition that is also around there. Let me try to find the number for folks uh, in a split second here, because it's actually crucial. People may actually want to get yeah, E4922. That's the number of people who want to go and sign it. That's why I want to take the time to find it now. So there's that petition. Um, so it's obviously a just cause, really. So we don't really have much more to comment on that front. Uh, but I would say the other thing is just in terms of uh, Quebec, you did have some success with the UKUAM encampment. Um, where they were able to actually get some wins uh, and, and in exchange, obviously, they did shut down the encampment, but they got some wins. Uh, I believe one of them was around, uh, Angler was saying it was terrible, it was specifically around not engaging with universities that commit human rights violations. It was something along those lines, which really implicitly would mean that challenge with, uh, with Israel uh, would be the main thing. And well, on the other side, not so good news, of course, Laval. Uh, they tried to set up an encampment, police prevented it. And then, of course, as was hit on earlier, you got uh, McGill, U of T presidents, just hyper, hyper desperate to uh, get the ability to crack down these protesters and uh, your mode and well maybe in the case of UT uh, perhaps get a big uh, big endowment. Other than that, there is one another it's in an article from Campbell's um there's this group calling itself to be anti hate. Um, it's called Enough T O really it's a Zionist liberal Zionist um, organization that's just acting as a proxy for the Zionists uh, to in Toronto to, um, to really take shots at uh, and demean the Palestine solidarity uh, movement. Um, they've engaged with TAFSIC uh, before, um, super reactionary Zionist organization. Um, someone like Douglas Murray has been uh, supported by them before, I believe around an event that was done. And of course they've actually engaged directly with the Toronto police. So they're, they, they come, you know, my eye even personally a few months ago when they started putting out their, I just got a message all of a sudden in, from my inbox and it was just this group, enough TO, just talking about, oh, hate, hate, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, the longer they go along and also with more digging done by uh, someone from the cat files, Eventually, you know, their 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 real character becomes very clear. It's a liberal Zionist project, and just as with the liberal Zionist project more broadly, it's just it provides a nice liberal, you know, peace loving yada yada face to um, what is a fascist entity, and what is a fa what are fascist ideas and support for fascist ideas. So there are some some interesting things, very interesting things happening in the last week. And that's my recap. Yeah, the students at uh, UFT and at McGill during the graduation ceremonies, the convocations uh, did, you know, come on stage with a Palestinian flag or banners calling for ceasefire or divestment and so on. 
Uh, and uh, I think the more most impressive action during the convocations was U of T students uh, setting up all these chairs with graduation hats and listing the names of Palestinian uh, students that were martyred before they received their degrees um, in Gaza. And of course, you know, all the universities in Gaza are now destroyed. So it's, it's you know, the, these students are doing actually, I think, the most important work right now in Canada. And they're risking the most and they're triggering uh, all these, uh, uh, you know, fault lines within the government and structures of power and society, you know, connecting it back to the parliamentary hearing uh, from the uh, Committee on Human Rights. Uh, it's clear that this is what's bothering the Zionists the most. And that's an indicator that this is the most successful thing. Uh, obviously, I've, I've, I've been a, a pain in the neck, a thorn in their side um, for decades, and they're going to bring me up every time they talk. Uh, there's, you know, seems like I, 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 I live rent free in the head of, uh, of house father and, um, all these other nasty, uh, Zionist uh, MPs. Um, and it shouldn't be a surprise that this committee wouldn't allow any non-Zionist to come and testify. I mean, the, Heritage Committee met seven times to discuss my file and refused to invite me to speak about myself. So you could see that. You see, they said they, they're too scared of the of somebody arriving at a parliamentary committee and speaking. Because when you speak in front of a parliamentary committee, you have legal immunity. You see? This is why uh these uh, filthy uh, MPs uh, decide to go uh, nasty, so nasty against people and calling them names and libeling and, and slandering people during these hearings because they have parliamentary immunity. And they're scared of somebody like myself coming in and calling them names live and having the parliamentary immunity also and that they can't sue me back. So... Uh, I, I think it's also an indicator. Uh, look, the the you know the Zionists can wish as much as they want, but they they not all their wishes will come true. They can uh, attempt to force these universities to abide by the I R H A I H R A sorry, um, uh, but that will be challenged in court and it will lose. The only reason that the I H R A is standing at the Heritage Canada currently, for instance, as a, something that you have to sign to receive funding after they cut the funding from CMAC, the Community Media Advocacy Center, is because nobody challenged it in court out of those NGOs and community organizations that are taking the money right now from Heritage. If one of them had the guts and, and took it to court, it wouldn't stand. Uh, there's no way a government can force you to take a political position and, you know, otherwise you don't uh, receive funding. That's that's a breach of the Charter of Rights. Uh, similarly, these, these cases uh, in the universities, they will not stand in court. Uh, and as we saw, McGill already lost. Uh, UFT is not even trying that. And, and this is the way it's going. For sure. Uh, one of the, the points that Mara Todd um, Mukiaba made in the article that's going to come out is that, uh, you know, the committee hearings really were shaping the new protesters and the pro-Palestine youth to be enemies of the state, right? Not that these people inherently want to be enemies of the state, but by opposing colonialism, having some infancy of a sense of anti-imperialism, um, that, you know, the state is, make, has decided that they are in the United States. And that's really, I think, the core, you know, in Mark, Mar <laughs> uh, bless this guy's heart, very, very fiery. Um, 
he said he said it well. You know, uh, it's all about either the, either they're going to get jailed or the students, the protesters are going to get jailed. Uh, and I am in I'm in full agreement there. That's not one of the cases where he was too fiery. Um, it's that's it the reality, you know. Uh, there is, we've reached a real tipping point in terms of political sentiments, and Palestine is such a such a blatant issue. Even the most, you know, most liberal left-minded of people, people who will say they're socialists, they're not. But even those people, you know, even those people are flipping, you know, mad about this. They're furious about it. You have someone like a really UK pushed judge in the ICC, uh, Karim Khan, um, having to go through emotions. Uh, in front of the case, and they obviously disgracefully equated uh, Palestinian resistance and, you know, the genocide of Israelis. Um, but even going through the motions of putting that kind of farce indicates that the situation has changed really, really badly uh, for them. And so, yeah, they, they're trying to get their prelude, they're trying to ensure their prelude towards repression. Now, will that succeed? Not going to say for sure. It's hard to say. Uh, but they want it. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, uh, I don't see them succeeding. The thing is that the those who are working for the liberation of Palestine uh, must not get distracted with these uh, lawfare and or you know, government pressure or what have you. That's not to say that they should ignore it or that they shouldn't fight it in court like the students did in McGill or whatever. But that this, anytime the government or the Zionists want to draw you into a controlled uh, atmosphere as in the legal system and or the parliament system, which are very controlled systems, you know, it's... it's uh, for now, we're winning in courts, you know, because the, the, the Zionists are being too sloppy and or the government hasn't fully activated its control over the legislator. They're still keeping this illusion that there's a separation between the courts and the state. The courts are there to in, in, uh, enforce the will of the state in reality. So uh, while this is, every time they draw you there is because they think that they have a better chance at winning in those venues. Now we know that the the street, the people, are with us. They're not under the control of the Zionists, and and those streets, uh, those campuses of universities, are where the movement for the liberation of Palestine uh, has the upper hand, and has the backing of the student unions, has the backing of the labor unions, has the backing of big part of the, the, the professors and teachers unions, as we saw the T University of Toronto professors and or the Canadian Association of Teachers, uh, you know, taking these positions. These are the venues you want to keep on building new uh, actions in and pushing the envelope further without getting fully distracted. And, and, and I think there is uh, this is something that, uh, you know, may, may, maybe some of these youth are new into organizing, but those who are not new at organizing should recognize that, you know, the way you work in campaigns is that you have to have, uh, you keep on pushing the, the line, the red line that your enemy has, you keep on pushing it. And you keep on raising the intensity of the activities every time so there will be no dullness in the coverage of, you know, if, if, if all we've been talking about right now for the last month is these encampments at universities, how long is the media attention going to stay? Summer starting, all of these things, right? So people have to build their uh, strategies and their actions and so forth in a uh, staged manner in uh, planned out intervals, in 
uh, you know, uh, raising of intensity, widening the space of conflict where this conflict with the Zionists is happening, you know, and and this is this is what we should be doing. It's clear what they will be doing, and they have no other uh, paths as Zionists. They already control the media, they control the government. They uh, so there's not like there's nothing. There's you know. So what they will be trying to do is limit the spaces and or drag you, the spaces that we control and have an upper hand in, either limit them and or drag you into venues that they have upper hands in. And that's what people working in these on these issues have to keep in mind. All right, like, well, I think that's a very uh, good way to leave things off for this episode. So Canada follows viewers uh, and well, it's been a, another great episode of this series, Canada, Palestine, the War on Zionism. Laith, thank you for co-hosting this uh, episode uh, along with me. Uh, and to the audience, thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this latest episode. To you all, uh, if you want to support the Campbell Journalism, if you want to support Free Palestine TV, I would obviously vocally encourage you to do both of those things. And well, I wish you all a good day. Take care. Goodbye.